All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for Protecting and Advancing Human Rights in 2018 and beyond. This is the official, official debut of PWN USA's policy agenda, our strategic advocacy priorities for this year and, and well beyond. Um, so my name is Arnita Rogers. I'm the policy director here at PWN USA. I just want to do a quick check to make sure everyone can hear me okay, if you could respond in the chat box. Great. Okay, so as I was saying, my name is Arnita Rogers. I'm the policy director at Positive Women's Network USA. I'm also going to be joined today by our wonderful uh, reproductive justice and HIV fellow, Rebecca Wayne. And we are looking forward to sharing with you what has been over a year in the making of our policy agenda um, that we are hoping to help guide our advocacy um, well beyond this, this political moment. Um, so, oh, just as a quick housekeeping, so everyone is on mute as attendees right now, but feel free to um, put your questions in the chat box if you have them along the way. There's also a Q&A function down, should be down at the bottom of your screen if you're joined uh, via, via your computer, um, so feel free to put questions there too, and we'll also save some time at the end of our, um, of the session to answer questions so, so folks would have an opportunity to come off mute that way. So why we updated our priorities? Um, well, I think um, anyone that's joining this webinar probably assume that we know what the state of our current political climate is. Um, we are experiencing some of the most grave threats to our health, human rights, bodily autonomy, and safety that at least I've experienced in, in my lifetime. Um, and so while we know that we have to fight like hell to um, you know, protect the programs and the policies that have you know, maintained our survival at this time. Um, we also know that we, this moment requires a vision of us that um, is beyond this political moment because we know we're not going to be here forever. We need to uh, think about what is, um, you know, beyond conceivably politically possible at this moment and think about how we can also build new systems that actually meet our needs holistically and more equitably. And so, um, you know, after the 2016 election, we really began to take stock of the emerging, emerging needs of our, our members and our, our broader constituency and look at gaps in the advocacy landscape in HIV, the HIV movement, and reproductive justice movement to actually think about how we could elevate the analysis of the impact of particular policies as they impacted specifically um, women of color, black women specifically, um, low-income women, uh, women of trans experience, and, and women in the U.S. South, where we see some of the greatest um, um, inequities and health disparities in terms of HIV. Also, uh, we're really excited that we're now working through a new strategic plan as of 2018, and so we really want to make sure that our policy priorities were actually um, in alignment with um, the shifts that we will be taking in our new strategic plan. It's very exciting. So how did we get here? Um, so like I was saying, this process has been over a year in the making. Um, we started back in the spring of 2017, but I guess even a little bit before as we, um, you know, really began to reach out to our members after the election um, in 2016. But we formed a policy agenda squad, and this was a group of um, PWN members, board members, and staff who um, came together to inform this process and um, really guide us through what it would take to make this process uh, really community grounded and informed. Um, and so we looked at several different sources of data from within our membership and beyond. We did a membership survey. Um, we conducted listening sessions. Um, and did some, you know, informal listening sessions on our regional organizing calls. Uh, we did some community mapping to see geographically, you know, where was our reach, you know, where had our advocacy been reaching and our members there, um, and what issues were important for them. Um, and then we looked to, um, you know, research, research that we had generated and outside of research. Um, specifically, we looked at some of the findings from 
a report that we did, a community-based participatory research project, and a report that resulted securing the future of women-centered care that looked at barriers women living with HIV were facing in terms of accessing care um, in the Ryan White program. And then, of course, as I mentioned, um, you know, we want to bring this process and we want to bring our strategic advocacy priorities in alignment with our strategic plan. Right. So a little bit about our membership survey. Um, yeah, it was conducted in May of last year and we had over 200 um, members participate in the survey. Um, you know, and it provided a, a great assessment of the demographics of our membership and also um, the advocacy concerns that were uh, most pressing for folks and what people actually thought were important issues for PWN to lead. Um, so our membership survey revealed and you know what we really did know but with more specific specificity and, and data to back it up is that um, our most common member is a black woman living with HIV with very low income, um, likely to be living in a city, um, and probably relies on a host of public services, either at the federal or state level, uh, even getting health care through um, federal programs like Medicaid and Ryan White, and depending on things like SNAP or food stamps or SSDI for survival. Um, you know, some of the issues that also came up consistently throughout our membership survey um, that folks thought that we should maintain our advocacy or want to be a bigger presence of us advocating on, um, especially in light of the, the 2016 election, were access to quality health care, economic justice and employment, violence against women living with HIV, and HIV-related criminalization. So as I was saying, um, immediately after the election, we thought it was critical for us to um, get in touch with our, our base and our constituency to see how um, they needed us and wanted us to show up um, in, in resistance to what we could um, predict would be the policies that, come, that have been coming from this current administration. So we held three post-election listening sessions. And then as we began to think about uh, re fashioning our policy agenda, we also held um, policy issue-based calls to as, as listening sections as well. So we did a call on sexual and reproductive health and rights. We did a specific call on racial justice, and then another one on criminalization and looking at criminalization um, beyond HIV criminalization, but also, of course, as HIV criminalization is related to other forms of criminalization, um, such as the criminalization of sex work. Um, <clears throat> And then we really want to make sure that we were um, hearing from and taking leadership from um, our communities that, and elevating their voices. So we also had um, a, a call specifically looking at um, uh, trans rights, safety, and reproductive justice, and a call specifically for young women living with HIV. Um, each of the calls were about an hour to an hour and a half. We had questions in free format. Um, uh, where people could ask us questions, but really just trying to listen to, you know, what did people want us to lead on. Um, overall, we had 40 unique participants, <coughs> excuse me, and um, participants from all across the country, as you can see from what I have here. And they were, of course, open to all women living with HIV. Um, and so, as I was mentioning also that we are now currently operating under a new organizational strategic plan and where we are, um, we've made four strategic shifts um, in the way that we are um, doing our movement work um, and working organizationally. So um, in our, one of our new um, strategic shifts is that we are explicitly centering racial justice and we are operating under a, a new racial justice, frame, racial justice framework that we've come up with in our organization and has been, has been informed by, by our, our movement partners and folks that we work in coalition with. Um, and so, in thinking about that, our, our new policy priorities, though, um, I think we really did um, center, um, you know, the experiences of people of color. We really want to think about how to elevate racial justice and make it front and center in, in all of our policy and advocacy priorities. Um, we also have employed a new membership engagement model. And so, um, from our membership survey, it was revealed that um, a lot of our members are not affiliated with our chapters. And I know our chapters are, are well known 
for the amazing advocacy and campaigns that they lead on, but we also had a lot of members who were um, doing some work and engaging in campaigns based on um, their location that were important to them. And so we want to make sure that we also had um, an overall agenda that reflected um, members who could also engage, who were not affiliated in chapters, but also doing really important work in, in their states. Um, we're growing into a power building and base building model of our or organizing and advocacy. And so um, we're looking at issues and campaigns that can actually, um, that are more intersectional and that can actually expand our reach and build our base for people who can show up and turn out for issues across the board that are important to our, our constituency. Um, and then finally, we are shifting into doing more electoral organizing work. And so as we think about um, the, the upcoming elections, we want to make sure that our issues are issues that can be elevated in uh, an electoral organizing platform. Great. So um, our updated policy agenda, uh, and it's on our, on our website, um, is uh, kind of broken up into four different pieces. Um, so we have six new um, priority areas. Some are, are, are very similar to what the priorities that we have been working under, but, you know, um, revision. Um, and each bucket uh, or each priority has a state of vision, um, you know, what we would like to see in the world um, for women living with HIV. And then we do um, a short analysis of the current state of play. Um, what are the policy conditions that we are operating on during this time. And then um, from that, we provide uh, policy recommendations at the federal, state, and sometimes local level where relevant. And um, then of course, we want to include resources uh, for folks to be able to get more information and also ways to take action with our partners. If this is not work that we're, we're leading, we want to be sure to elevate um, the resources and uh, uh, ways to plug into campaigns that our partners and allies are, are moving forward with. So without further ado, I will get into our first um, new bucket, which is universal health care. Um, so, you know, we have been doing work on health care access and um, health equity issues, um, looking at women, you know, working towards women-centered care for women living with HIV, but we really thought we wanted to think about a vision that was really all encapsulating, you know, what would it be to achieve universal health care? And uh, we think that universal health care means high quality, holistic health care, regardless of gender identity, race, immigration status, or ability to pay. Um, and I should have gone back to say that um, we are really fortunate to have worked with a, a wonderful artist, Megan Smith, of the Repeal Hyde Art Project to give us some really wonderful images to capture our new policy priorities that you'll see as we go through. So, um, as I was saying, our, our vision is that all women living with HIV will have access to high quality, culturally relevant, non-stigmatized, and affordable health care and services to achieve emotional, mental, and physical wellness, regardless of sex assigned at birth race, immigration status, or ability to pay. Um, and so we see that this is very comprehensive. We, um, you know, we're not looking for um, a system that does not support access to um, comprehensive sexual and reproductive health care services or mental health because we know to achieve um, wholeness and, and health that, that all those pieces are, are critical. And so um, this is our, really our vision to making that accessible to everyone. Um, the current state of play, I think that this is also probably well known, is that uh, right now women living with HIV are um, getting care through a patchwork of systems that may or may not be working well in coordination, um, or that are filling gaps, um, but needs are still, um, you know, not being completely met. There's inequitable access, and we know especially for our um, folks of trans experience who are facing a lot of discrimination in healthcare settings. Um, and while we made a lot of advances in access to care and coverage gains um, by the Affordable Care Act, we know that some communities were left completely behind, um, especially when we think about access to care for immigrants. And so at the federal level, um, we recommend 
moving towards a federal single payer health care system. Um, you know, we don't believe that um, we can actually achieve universal health care if we continue to maintain our reliance on a, a system that is driven by profit. And so, yes, yeah, this is a system that has, um, you know, allowed many of us to survive until this point, but um, we, you know, envisioning what's beyond and getting towards universal health care and an equitable system, we want to make sure that we can move towards a single payer government run system that actually ensures comprehensive medical services to to all, you know, and that is inclusive of sexual reproductive health care. Um, and this is regardless of the ability to pay. Um, we need to, especially in this moment, maintain and fully fund the Ryan White care program. Um, it's main, it's been a really critical gap filler, um, especially for communities that have been left behind by the Affordable Care Act um, and also funds many uh, what they call you know, support, supportive services that, um, you know, look at some of the root cause analysis of, of and root cause um, issues that folks need to maintain care and health. health. So um, we need to maintain uh, the Ryan White program and also think about how we can build upon it um, to really fully integrate sexual reproductive health care throughout the program. Um, we want to expand access to care for all immigrants. Um, this is re regardless of documentation. Um, we, we know that we are facing, a, our political moment is um, extremely violent uh, and xenophobic um, and healthcare of immigrants, people are being pushed further and further underground. And so we want to um, remove barriers to care like waiting limits to like, uh, to get access to care through um, Medicaid or through other programs, um, and also um, to remove any other barriers that, that immigrants might face um, in trying to get care. Um, so at the federal level, we certainly oppose any tax to the Affordable Care Act, and I think that um, you know, we've seen PWN really show up to protect the Affordable Care Act, and we've seen um, huge gains for people living with HIV under the program, particularly um, through states that um, expanded Medicaid. Um, and then, as importantly, we oppose any tax to, to Medicaid, so um, budget proposals that try to completely decimate the program and, um, you know, the, at the federal level, approving um, waivers that allow for Medicaid work requirements and state programs. Um, and going back to expanding access or improving um, access to care for um, for all immigrants, we uh, vehemently oppose um, the use of public charge determinations um, that are have been used and, um, you know, uh, we're expecting a, a rule to come down any day from the administration to expand the determinations that look at how likely immigrants are to use public services or subsidize health care and to exclude them from entering the country and becoming residents or citizens. So um, at the state level, our recommendations are, are similar. Um, there is a momentum also to push for state single payer health plans while we are sorting out the behemoth of you know, what it would take to um, you know, move toward the single payer health care system at the federal level. Many states are actually moving forward with legislation to implement these programs at the state level, and we um, really support that movement. Um, we all states should expand Medicaid. This is where we've seen the huge coverage, coverage gains for people living with HIV, and we know that um, the states where that have chosen not to expand Medicaid are some of the very states that have some of the deepest disparities um, for people living with HIV, especially in the South. Um, and all states should take advantage and, and expand Medicaid. Um, and at the state level, we also, uh, of course, oppose uh, Medicaid work requirements, whether that's gone through a waiver or if states are trying to actually legislate to impose um, barriers to accessing um, Medicaid through work requirements. But this also includes um, any onerous uh, reporting um, uh, requirements that are being um, put on uh, recipients of Medicaid or um, things like lockout periods for folks that fail to demonstrate that they um, have been working. So 
we also post those. All right. And so our next bucket is economic justice. Um, you know, and so as I was saying that majority of our constituency are people who are living uh, well at, at or well below the federal poverty line. And so economic justice is a critical importance for us to advocate upon uh, from a really intersectional lens. Um, so um, women living with HIV deserve financial security. It's as simple as that. Um, our vision is that uh, we live in a world where women living with HIV um, do not, don't face negative employment or economic consequences related to their health status, sex, gender, or gender expression, family responsibilities, race, or ethnicity. Further, we envision a world where women living with HIV are fully supported and prepared to participate in the work, workforce in ways that we choose. Um, so um, we know that in the current state of play in our political moment, that women and folks with trans experience who are living with HIV are more likely than men who are living with HIV um, to live below the federal poverty line. Um, there is gender-based discrimination and hyper of people of trans experience that um, you know, creates barriers to employment. Um, and we're seeing at the federal level, it's very transparent and deliberate a war on poor people um, with um, budget proposals that continually propose um, draconian cuts to the federal essential social safety net. So that being said, at the federal level, uh, we, um, we support advancing opportunities employment opportunities for people living with HIV. Um, and we think that um, different federal agencies, federal agencies like the Department of Education, the Department of Labor should be coordinating to create federal jobs programs or vocational rehab programs specifically for people living with HIV. Um, and that um, there are also opportunities for um, employment services to be integrated throughout the Ryan White program. And that should be advanced. Um, we support in the federal ban the box um, policies for um, public and private employers. So these are um, policies that remove barriers or seek to remove barriers for people who have um, been convicted of felonies um, and making it, uh, removing that question from an uh, application process to make it easier to facilitate them um, getting employment. Um, we also know because of the gender discrimination um, that people of trans experience face that we need to uh, really be proactive about um, seeking employment discrimination protection. Um, and we could um, move forward with passing legislation like the Equality Act or other um, legislation that seeks to um, expand federal civil rights protections to include sexual orientation or, or gender identity, and gender identity, I should say. Um, and then at the federal level, we also um, support removing the ban on, um, on the receiving federal benefits for people who have been convicted of drug uh, felonies, especially. Um, and so we know that having a felony conviction can, uh, on your record can prohibit you from applying for student loans, applying for housing, um, can even apply you from, um, uh, create a barrier for you applying for, for SNAP. Um, and so we want to remove those barriers. Um, and then, as I was saying, we oppose all cuts to the essential or social safety net. Um, you know, we've seen, uh, you know, as Medicaid as part of the health care program, but we've seen it and, um, and um, proposed cuts to, to SNAP and even coming up in ways that, um, that hasn't come up before, you know, as, as really harmful policy writers to unrelated pieces of legislation. And so we, uh, we really oppose those. Um, and finally, um, we oppose adding a citizenship, citizenship question to the 2020 census, which is aimed at deterring um, um, immigrants from participating and being counted in the 2020 census. And as a result, um, you know, um, having less funding being appropriated to uh, the, the states that would um, serve in programs um, across the country. So at the state level, 
uh, we support uh, living wage legislation or movement for fight for 15 and beyond. Um, similarly, as at the federal level, uh, we support, support ban the box and fair chance hiring hiring laws that um, you know remove barriers for people who have been convicted of felonies or have them on their record. Um, and we also um, at the state level would like to advance uh, more policies around inclusive paid sick, safe, and family leave. Um, you know, as a part of our um, uh, research project on the securing the future of women-centered care, we learned that um, a lot of our members were taking care of family across generation and across what is, um, you know, sees as like a, a government definition of family um, and, and caring for um, chosen family. And so we want to, um, there are many states that are in, in local jurisdictions that are looking at more inclusive family de definitions um, and also looking at opportunities to provide um, paid sick and safe days for people who are navigating um, experiences of interpersonal violence or even having to navigate something like going to court. Um, and we think those should be advanced. Um, and then similarly, uh, we think expand, we should expand employment opportunities for people living with HIV through collaboration with state agencies. So just as, um, you know, we could do this at the federal level, there are also opportunities to do this at state levels with the Department of Education or Department of Re Rehabilitation Services to um, design programs specifically for people living with HIV. Um, and in those, um, both at the federal and state level, I should say that um, those programs should also um, reflect um, barriers experience or be designed to really um, remove barriers for people, um, communities of people living with HIV who experience even more barriers, so people of trans experience and then immigrants to gain meaningful employment. Great, so I'm gonna take, uh, or I'm gonna turn it over to Rebecca who is going to cover the rest of our, our, our new buckets. Okay, hi everybody. This is Rebecca, she, her pronouns. Uh, as Arnita said, I'm the Reproductive Justice HIV Fellow here at PWN and I'll be taking us through uh, the last four uh, policy priority areas. All right, so our vision for this bucket is that PWN USA works towards a world where full reproductive justice and bodily autonomy, including the right to pleasurable sex, are upheld for any person of any gender and any HIV status. Is there an echo? All right, sorry about that. Okay, that's fine. Um, bodily autonomy is the idea that individuals have the right to control what does and does not happen to their bodies. The current state of play, um, as we all know, reproductive rights for women and uh, sexual and reproductive, uh, sexual and reproductive health care for LGBTQ uh, individuals and communities are under repeated and worsening attack. Ideologically driven policies and funding shifts shifts designed to control or restrict sexual and reproductive agency, especially for low-income women, women of color, and immigrants um, is on the rise, and women living with HIV and women of trans experience of any HIV status continually to face persistent HIV-related and gender-based stigma and discrimination from providers. So our recommendations on the federal level, uh, we support repealing the federal ban on abortion funding and passing what's called the Each Woman Act. The Each Woman Act was introduced in 2017 by Congresswoman Barbara Lee. Uh, essentially, it would remove the longstanding ban on the use of federal funds um, for abortion care. Um, so this would essentially make sure that no woman, and no woman is the language used in the act, but essentially no one should be denied access to an abortion based on an inability to pay or fear of incurring a large financial burden. We also support maintaining Title X, 
Title X is the federal program that provides um, a lot of funding to clinics uh, around reproductive health care, cancer screening services, STI screening services, um, well women exams, et cetera. And uh, as you all already know, Title X funding currently is um, at risk, especially in terms of funding that Planned Parenthood uses to provide those services. Um, so definitely uh, there is an attack focused really on shutting down uh, abortion clinics completely or sharply reducing the funding that goes to those clinics uh, that are providing these comprehensive health services. We also support full integration of sexual and reproductive health throughout the Ryan White program. And we also support uh, the availability of over-the-counter oral contraceptives. Uh, on the federal level, we oppose any policies that restrict or limit access to safe and legal abortions. And we also oppose the use of religious refusals um, and certain religious freedom policies that are really aimed at uh, legalizing discrimination uh, against folks that seek those services. On the state level, we support public and private insurance coverage for sexual and reproductive health services, regardless of uh, gender ID, repealing laws that criminalize negative pregnancy outcomes, um, including that can include the use of medication abortion, um, self-induced abortions, et cetera. Uh, coverage for extended supply of contraception by public and private insurers. And on the state level, we oppose, uh, once again, any policies that restrict access to abortion care. So our next policy priority area is around ending criminalization. Uh, PWN, uh, its members, its staff, its chapters, of course, have been working on HIV criminalization um, in a, deeply and widely in all, on all areas, but um, for purposes of updating the agenda, the question was really what you know, areas can we plug into around criminalization generally, because HIV criminalization um, is really a symptom of um, all of the issues related to criminalization generally and uh, a symptom closely tied to mass incarceration as well. So, uh, yes, our vision for this area um, is we envision and work toward a future in which our communities are no longer subject to over-policing, surveillance, and brutality at the hands of law enforcement, and where those with a history of interaction with the criminal justice system have full rights and dignity. So the current state of play, Black people, non-Black people of color, queer and trans people, people who use drugs, sex workers, and immigrants are all disproportionately targeted by law enforcement and too often face violent interactions with police. People living with HIV are specifically targeted by existing HIV criminalization laws, uh, and the criminalization of sex work and drug use is ongoing and in a lot of ways have ramped up under this administration. So our recommendations on the federal level, we support passage of the Repeal HIV Discrimination Act. So this is a federal law that would uh, essentially provide a lot of financial support and incentives to states that are actively uh, interested in or trying to modernize their HIV laws. Uh, we also support passing the Pretrial and Integrity Safety Act. This is a bill initially introduced by Senator Kamala Harris. A similar bill has very recently been introduced by Senator Sanders and Representative Ted Lieu called the No Money Bill Act of 2018. But essentially the aim is to completely remove the use of cash bail at the federal level um, and similar to the Repeal HIV Act to provide financial support and incentives for states who are also trying to do away with cash bail. Generally, the use of cash bail is something that's used to punish people who are low income. Um, it holds them in detention for prolonged periods of times simply because they can't afford to, to pay for bail. That's been an ongoing issue that um, these laws would do a lot toward uh, rolling back. Um, on the federal level, we also support removing the existing US entry ban on sex workers. Um, and on the federal level, we oppose really any revival of the war on drugs, um, and we oppose cooperation between local law enforcement um, and immigration and custom enforcement. On the state level, um, of course, we are supporting ongoing campaigns to repeal state HIV criminalization laws. Um, we support the decriminalization of sex work at the state level. 
we are also in support of the elimination of so-called condoms as evidence policies. So a lot of states um, have kind of informal policies that aren't actually laws that allow law enforcement um, to use condom possession as evidence that somebody is a sex worker or is soliciting sex. Um, generally, this results in people not carrying condoms out of fear of being criminalized. And in some instances, police are known to confiscate people's condoms or give them back, but after destroying them and making them completely unusable. Um, on the state level, we also support adopting and funding harm reduction services. Um, so that's harm reduction services typically for sex workers and people who use drugs that go toward providing health services and support um, in environments that protect them from being further criminalized or uh, surveilled by law enforcement. We also support at the state level elimination of felony disenfranchisement policies. So depending on uh, the state, um, there are policies in place that can completely remove the right to vote for people who have been convicted of felonies. Even after release, uh, sometimes the voting ban lasts uh, for a lifetime. Um, and the process, if a process is in place to restore that voting right is usually incredibly long and incredibly complicated. Uh, and a lot of people are completely discouraged from attempting uh, to get their voting rights restored as a result. At the state level, we oppose any attempt to expand criminal penalties based on HIV status. Um, so some states have, you know, um, I believe it's Rhode Island has kind of played with the idea of introducing an HIV criminalization bill. So um, as we're reforming existing laws, we also want to oppose uh, any expansion or creation of HIV criminalization laws. So our next policy priority area is trans rights, safety and justice. This was informed by one of those uh, community-based calls that we had as a listening session early on in this development process. So our vision, um, we work toward a future in which all people of trans experience are supported to live fulfilling, secure, and happy lives, free from all forms of violence, harassment, hosti hostility, or discrimination. So the current state of play, um, there are increased efforts to dismantle existing protections against discrimination based on gender identity in schools, at work, and in healthcare facilities. Um, there's definitely an increase in support for religious objection policies um, that are being implemented at both the federal and state levels that essentially allow people to discriminate against people of trans experience based on their personal uh, belief uh, around uh, those communities. Um, also, the over-criminalization and escalation of violence against trans and gender non-conforming people is, that has definitely been ramping up under this administration as well. So recommendations at the federal level, we support maintaining section 1557 of the Affordable Care Act. Um, this is a section that requires that healthcare providers um, act in a non-discriminatory manner um, and protects people um, from being discriminated against or being denied care based on their sexual orientation or gender identity. At the federal level, we also support passage of the Do Not Harm Act. This is federal legislation that very specifically limits uh, religious, the use of religious freedom um, as a way to discriminate against other communities. At the federal level, uh, we oppose, you know, creation of and wrapping up of any religious refusal policies that allow discrimination. At the state level, we support laws that uh, facilitate gender marker corrections on legal documents. Currently, uh, most states make that process relatively difficult and being able to have a correct gender marker um, is an issue of safety and security for a lot of people who are uh, transgender, non-binary, uh, gender non-conforming. Um, we also support expanding gender ID options on legal documents, so allowing people to choose non-binary as a gender option as opposed to just uh, male, female. Um, we also support state and local gender uh, identity non-discrimination laws. Um, so especially non-discrimination laws that are very explicit about protecting people based on gender identity. And we also support policies that preserve the dignity of transgender people in prisons. Previously, there were protections in place that more or less guaranteed 
that people with trans experience uh, would go to facilities that match their gender identity. Those protections are under attack, um, which is a huge safety and security concern for those folks who are you know, uniquely vulnerable to violence um, while incarcerated. At the state level, we also oppose state and local bathroom bills. So bills that require and threaten people with punishment for using bathrooms that you know, may not match uh, their sex assigned at birth or uh, whatever gender marker they might currently have on their ID at that time. So our last policy priority area is working to end violence against women living with HIV, um, really saying that women living with HIV deserve to be free from violence at all levels, interpersonal, community, and structure violence, structural violence, um, and that they, they, they deserve to be supported to heal from that violence. Our vision um, is a world where women living with HIV are free uh, from all of those levels of violence and also safe to report interpersonal violence when it occurs and be supported in healing from trauma that results from violence experienced in this lifetime um, and trauma that exists, that has existed um, throughout past generations. The current state of play, 60% of women living with HIV in the US may have experienced intimate partner violence at some point in their lives. Women living with HIV in the US are disproportionately affected by community level violence and structural violence, racism, HIV stigma, transphobia, and the historical linking of access to care, to employment, and a safety net system that requires people to be poor or sick in order to, sorry, I have a bar in the place of the last line of this. I can just move on to the next slide. All right, our recommendations at the federal level, we support maintaining the Violence Against Women Act. That's federal legislation that has really done a lot in shining light on the issue, the persistent issue of domestic and intimate partner violence against women, and does a lot in terms of funding, support services uh, for survivors of that violence. Uh, we also support removing the annual cap on U visas. U visas uh, are a visa that allows survivors of violent crimes to stay in the U.S. without threat of being deported. Um, currently, that is a pretty restrictive process, um, so we're hoping to remove the annual cap on that. We also support integrating trauma-informed care and intimate partner violence screenings and response in all areas of HIV care. At the federal level, we oppose any attempts to weaken or undermine the Violence Against Women Act. At the state and local level, we support incorporating trauma-informed indicators and metrics into local getting to zero slash in the epidemic uh, campaigns, as well as state HIV AIDS strategies. We also support passing sanctuary city and sanctuary state legislation. So this is legislation that restricts lo local law enforcement from working with immigration and customs enforcement to ramp up immigration crackdowns um, and really to decimate immigrant communities. And then, so that was a, a lot. I will turn it back over to Arnita so she can tell us about ways that you can all take action with us uh, on these policy priority areas. Great, thank you, Rebecca. Um, yeah, so it was a lot, but I, I, know I saw some comment that, um, you know, that we have our work cut out for us but also that um, we're up for it. And I, I hope that that is the sentiment that most of us are sharing. Um, so we, we wanted to take this opportunity to, to say that, um, you know, we hope that this policy agenda, that it can be viewed as a dynamic platform, um, that it can be um, shaping and adapting to our needs as, that, as they emerge. And so um, if you'd like to share resources about a particular campaign that you're working on, that you think might fall under um, this new agenda that we put forth, please do share those with us. Um, and we hope to kind of make the resources that we've included in the resource section of um, the agenda on our website more like an evergreen place where things can be um, updated regularly and folks can stay as informed um, and as up to date as, as they can. Um, yeah, we want to know um, about any opportunities to join campaigns 
um, in your state, if you're working on particular issues um, in your state, you know, that's where we're looking towards the state right now, states in our organizing model as places where we can actually um, move progressive legislation, move um, legislation that is, you know, um, proactive and, and less reactive and, and, and reactive when we need to be but also uh, where, where we can actually have some wins. Um, you know, we hope you can continue to resist with us at the federal level. Um, you know, we sent out a monthly policy update. Um, we think it's really intersectional and try to, um, you know, show what's going on at the federal level from a, a wide range of topics from HIV to LGBTQ rights, um, to immigrant rights and reproductive justice. And so we can encourage you to um, stay plugged in with us in that way around um, you know, threats coming down at the federal level, also what's going on at the state level. Um, and then as we move forward with this policy agenda, we're going to be uh, doing a series of upcoming webinars on how to actually use it um, with folks that we are collaborating with and movement. And so we'll be doing a deeper dive on to, into the buckets um, to explore um, campaigns under, under each and, and to see where there's movement and alignment. Um, and then finally, um, you know, our website has been going through a really great revamping and uh, we've been, um, you know, placing our, our tools and resources and, and ways to make them more accessible. And we were, we're about to release a new advocacy toolkit. Um, and I so just want to plug that as another opportunity to kind of take action with us and on this, this new policy agenda. So you will be able to find that on our website soon. Um, all right, so at this time, I want to see if there were um, any questions. Um, and I can, um, you can go ahead and put them in the Q&A. Um, and also, you can feel free to raise your hand and I can take you off of you to do that. So uh, yes, Roxy, the recording will be available, slides will be available, and you know our hope is that especially for folks who are working in chapters or state leads, that you'll be able to use this presentation as a slot, as a as a resource, uh, and as a primer on our policy agenda going forward. Um, let's see, I think there are questions in the chat box. Okay, so there is a question. Um, to make sure people living with HIV are not discriminated again within the workforce pertaining to paid sick time, does the EEOC and Family Medical Leave Act cover that? So there are protections for people with disabilities under the EEOC and Family Medical Leave Act, um, but um, in terms of um, the campaigns that we're supporting in terms of um, paid sick family and safely, we're actually looking towards making those um, at the local level um, policies more expansive. So for people who are caring for chosen families, um, so people that might not be biologically related to you or um, even a grandparent or aunt taking care of a, a, a child um, in the same family, we wanna make sure that people actually are able to um, be paid for that time too. And so that's what we mean when we're looking at um, expanding those definitions and making sure those policies are inclusive of the type of um, caring and, and I guess caregiving relationships that um, a lot of our members and folks in our constituency have. Um, any other questions? Okay, let's see, I will try to switch. Let's see, it sounds like my, my sound was going out. Is it better now? Great.
Great, so not seeing um, any other questions. Um, you know, I want to share um, my contacts. Oh, hold on. Uh, Wahida has a has a question. Mahita, I think I um, have promoted you to a panelist, and so you're able to ask your question if you like that way, or you can put it in the chat box. Oh, you sorry. You know, she doesn't have a question. Okay, that's cool too. Um, yeah, so I will go ahead and share my contact information. So please reach out if you have any questions around anything that was shared today. Um, if you would like to consider working with us on campaigns under these issues, uh, issue buckets that we shared today, or want more information about um, our partners or allies that are working on any of these issues, please reach out to myself or Rebecca. We're here to be resources. Um, and this next step is just how we move forward and, and build from this, um, helping this to, to guide. So we, you know, like you said, there's plenty of things that we need to react to, but um, this is our time. We're building our power. We're honing our tactics and our skills. We're organizing and building power so that we can uh, move towards systems that actually serve us. So um, thank you everyone for joining and um, see you soon.